Hello everyone, it's Tomas Costal here, and welcome to this critical analysis of accessibility practices in the video game industry. Today, we will discuss the role of SDH subtitles, or subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, sometimes simply referred to as closed captions, or CC. We will start our discussion with a general outline of what common practice indicates a subtitle should be the essential conventions subtitles should follow, and the fundamental changes that would be necessary to reduce incongruity and extreme variance in how SDH subtitles are created and rendered in electronic entertainment products and a diversity of media outlets. But first things first. Editing subtitles requires condensation of the original message, linguistic expertise, and last but not least, dexterity in audiovisual translation. Translation in this context does not exclusively mean from language A, say English, to language B, for example Spanish. It may well apply to different varieties of the same language. When we proceed from a source language to a target language, as in the case of English to Spanish or vice versa, we will be talking about interlinguistic translation. On the other hand, When we are working within the boundaries of a single language, whichever it may be, the term we should be using is intralinguistic translation. However, in today's analysis we will be dealing much more with the way commonly agreed upon norms and conventions may help all stakeholders, industry and final users, to identify a number of core needs and requirements which contribute to the greater usability and accessibility of audiovisual multimedia productions. Subtitles in other media, such as cinema and television, tend to share a very similar layout. As consumers of audiovisual products, we are used to having two lines placed at the bottom of the screen, centred, appearing when the character begins the utterance and disappearing when the utterance ends. In other words, subtitles must be easily readable and synchronised with the actions which are taking place at any given moment. If subtitles go too fast, we won't be able to read them, and if they go too slowly, we will probably read them more than once, and this will cause us discomfort. Badly edited subtitles, therefore, are cumbersome for the viewer, and these bad choices which are made during the editing phase seem to be due to poor quality assessment, lack of attention to detail, the inexistence of a language department throughout the production and development of the multimedia creation, as well as idiosyncratic rather than well-informed decisions. In the particular case of video games, resorting to a norm that may provide medium-appropriate guidelines is definitely the way to go. Let us go through a few case studies now, observe attentively what the actual performance looks like, apply our critical analysis and finally summarize our findings to advance an initial proposal of a norm for SDH in video games. To put it another way, we will start with the particular and progressively build up to the general. Each case study comes in three parts. Firstly, we describe succinctly the selected video game and indicate the YouTube source from which we have cut the parts we are interested in. Secondly, we will go over the video clips and screenshots and make a number of observations concerning the use of what the video game refers to as subtitles. In some cases, these subtitles are hard-coded. In other words, they cannot be removed even if the player wants to. And in some other cases, they have been activated for the purposes of this study, but feature in the video game as optional. Thirdly, we will indicate which aspects of the subtitles could be acceptable and become part of a tentative version of our SDH norm, and which ones should be suppressed, omitted or modified to avoid obscurity, errors and end-user dissatisfaction. Let's get to it then. Case Study 1. Back to the Future, the video game, produced by Telltale Games and first released in 2010 for several platforms. The cutscenes, or audiovisual sections of the video game where player interaction is minimal, and watching prevails over doing things by means of the controller, have been obtained from Gamers Little Playgrounds YouTube gameplay. 
all references to the actual games, as well as to the source materials, are included in the video description. Let's see the clip from Back to the Future, a graphic adventure based on the homonymous film starring Michael J. Fox, and pay attention to three important points. Number one, where are the subtitles positioned on the screen? Number two, do the lines appear all at once? That is to say, are they pop-on subtitles? Or do they appear progressively? Roll-up subtitles. Finally, number three. Is synchronization compelling enough between the character's mouth movements, the recorded dialogue and the subtitled text? The clip is 45 seconds long, so feel free to take notes and stop whenever necessary. Hot Jesus Christ! Jesus Christ, Doc! You disintegrated Einstein! Oh no, Marty! I didn't disintegrate anything! The molecular structure of both Einstein and the car are completely intact! Where the hell are they? The appropriate question is, when the hell are they? You see, Einstein has just become the world's first time traveler! I sent him into the future! One minute into the future, to be exact! And at precisely 1.21 a.m. and zero seconds, we shall catch up with him and the time machine. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? And if a DeLorean? That was our first clip. You will have probably noticed that Synchrony leaves much to be desired, both in terms of the voices and the text. Also, the subtitle lines roll out rather than pop in all at once. This takes more time and is generally more distracting for the viewer and the player. Finally, subtitles change position depending on the amount of text that needs to be shown. With the help of these two screenshots, we may see the problems of shifting rollout subtitles. Here, for instance, the center of the screen contains two lines which appear superimposed over the character's face. Taken to the extreme, this may prove exasperating for the players and hinder their interaction. In addition, the lines are extremely long and incorrectly divided. Line division should never be arbitrary. Syntactic coherence is not simply desirable, but compulsory in subtitling especially when we take into account that hundreds of thousands of people, when not millions or even tens of millions, are exposed to the linguistic models and practices of a given video game. As we can see in this screenshot, quality assurance focused rather more on pure orthography than on subtitle sequencing and readability. Here's our final verdict for the first case study. General quality is rather poor, and the reasons are stated below. Rollout subtitles are more inefficient in terms of understanding. Line length should be restricted in all cases. Syntactic coherence should be revised in quality assurance. And under no circumstances should we cover people's mouths, characters' faces, and the central action taking place with text. We move on now to case study number two. This one is a puzzle adventure game entitled Catherine, developed by Atlas and first released in 2011. A source for the cutscenes was Uplay Network. A link is available in the description. Here's the first of two video clips. It is time we analyze other elements apart from dialogue or speaker interaction, what we call paralinguistic elements. Those sounds we produce and attach meaning to although this meaning may vary from culture to culture, but at the same time cannot easily be reflected as textual elements. We will keep talking about them after watching the clip. Quit joking around and listen. This is really important. Okay, sorry. This month, I'm running really late. Huh? I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> Say something! God. Sorry, uh... So, what are you thinking? So why am I sweating? 
I mean, I, I have to take responsibility, right? And that's our clip. What do you think about the use of the ellipses followed by the exclamation point as a descriptor of paralinguistic elements? In this case, the character's almost psychotic countenance accompanied by the sudden increase in sound effects. Does it really add anything? Indeed, does it help the reader to grasp the content of the scene better? Before you give your final answer, remember that this game has been dubbed into English and that the original is in Japanese. After all, we are dealing here with cultural differences, as we mentioned before. Apart from that, we have been presented with a line of text in the subtitles which tries to emulate the sound of the male characters swallowing. Asterisk, glug, asterisk, repeated twice. This, perhaps, is the game's own interpretation of a closed caption, idiosyncratic as it may be. If you were deaf or hard of hearing, you would not have access to those noisy sounds, soundtracks, musical scores, accents or speakers' moods and attitudes, which can only be perceived through the year. SDH subtitles enrich traditional subtitles by taking this requirement into account and including paralinguistic information that is not immediately obvious from what can be seen on the screen. Perhaps the asterisk, glug, asterisk, repeat twice, could have been omitted in light that the character is seen drinking from his china cup of tea. As for the ellipsis exclamation point, we discussed earlier that the deaf and hard of hearing, as anyone else, are not aided in any way by the inclusion of this subtitle. Let us continue with the second clip. We now know that the lines, in this game too, are too long mostly because they cover the whole screen from left to right, and the action takes place towards the center. But what about shot changes? If the shot does change, and the subtitle line does not, the player may unconsciously think that the text is not the same, and direct his or her eyes to the beginning of the line. Quick exchanges make this situation almost inevitable at times, but very often, as we will see in this clip, such situation may be avoided. Have a look, and you be the judge. Focus on the part where the man in the sunglasses talks about sleep and counting sheep without losing sight of the number of shot changes. What are you doing here? Did you people know the reason you're taught as a child to count sheep so you'll fall asleep is... Yeah, yeah, sheep rhymes with sleep or something. Ah... Sorry. Hey, boss. Another rum and cola, please? Hey, don't be so rough on the guy. One day we'll all be old farts like him. Not all of us. Notice that there are a total of four changes simultaneously with the utterance. This kind of practice is generally discouraged in film and also in television. We would argue that video games, either in the cutscenes or in the interactive sequences, should keep this important aspect in mind perhaps even more so than in other media. A question that we will revisit later in this video is character identification or utterance tagging. In other words, making explicit through text or colour who the actual speaker is. In the previous scene, for instance, the four men, the waitress and the man in the sunglasses intervene at different times. But for the deaf or hard of hearing, it may prove quite challenging to make this out at all times. Finally, let us analyse a few screenshots more closely. Here, for example, the lines are excessively long. In any case, the upper limit should be set within the same margins as television or film, that is to say, from 35 to 40 characters, and preferably under 37 characters, which is including spaces and punctuation marks. This would obviously lead to an increase in the total number of lines, but it would facilitate normalization and, in turn, reduce the number of exceptions both subtitlers and programmers would face. Here, the two lines are extremely different in length, even though their endeavor is to maintain syntactic coherence. We would advise condensation of the message together with further subdivision. 
on this particular occasion, the only element that is subtitled is the language that is produced orally, the audio track. However, if we were translating the video game interlinguistically, we would need to resort to some specific translation strategy to deal with the other two messages present as text on screen. Stray sheep on the background, as if it were the name of the bar, which would in turn be highly plot relevant. And then we also have the Italian stallion etc. text on the shoulder jacket, perhaps as an inside joke concerning the protagonist's taste for expensive fashionable items. Here we can see a combination of paralinguistic and linguistic elements in the same line. Once again, a subtitling norm oriented towards SDH in video games would need to specify the criteria for the former and for the latter. Why the asterisks, we might ask? Why not capital letters instead? Or a different colour? Here, apart from the question of asterisk, munch, asterisk, we may encounter the same speaker identification problem as before. Which of the young men is talking? When lip movements are unclear, we would need an alternative stylistic solution which does not clash with that we have already stated with reference to paralinguistic elements. Of course, the single line is extremely long. Condensation of the message would still be required. Finally, our critical verdict. The subtitles would be acceptable with certain alterations. The paralinguistic elements would need to be normalized, line length should be restricted, shot changes respected, and speaker identification, of course, is necessary. And with this we have reached case study number three. Anarchy Reigns, a beat-em-up 2012 video game developed by Platinum Games. The YouTube source from which our cutscenes have been obtained is Rabbit Retrospect Games. There's a link in the description. We should mention that budget costs, both in the design and voice acting stages, are considerably reduced when cutscenes decrease in cinematic quality. In this case, the dialogue is quite loosely synchronized and the character portraits are almost static. This happens for almost a third of the game. Before you watch, take into consideration how much text appears at once, the way it is sequenced and divided, whether it is syntactically coherent, faithful to what is uttered, or condensed, and whether it pays heed to the specific needs of SDH audiences. What is an official from the city doing out here? Durga, a bounty hunter. Former mercenary. Disciplined repeatedly for insubordination. Ooh, went berserk and killed partner. Nice. You're not answering my question! Durga and Led's exchange identifies the speakers by name. However, the color is the same for both speakers, and quite easy to confuse with the background. The font is tiny and hard to read, and does not reflect paralinguistic elements in any way. Durga's laugh is lost for SDH players, and Led's irritation should have been conveyed by means of a didascalic mood indicator, such as irritated, and then the text. The following screenshots reinforce our initial argument. Douglas's three-liner is incorrectly divided, and for the first time in the game uses three lines rather than the usual two, and none of them is used for tagging, describing sounds or reflecting moods, which would constitute a viable exception to the two-line rule. Again, the font is too small, and the colour clashes with the background hue. In this slide, the very long one-liner should have been divided into two parts, the second one starting in to such criminal activity. Although the font is hard to read, the colour is clearly visible. However, a black box around it 
would have made it stand out more proficiently. Here, the line division is adequate, but the lines are unnecessarily long, which might be one of the reasons why the font type is so small. Finally, our verdict for the third case study. Again, the subtitles would be considered acceptable with certain alterations, but they are definitely not SDH. The font size should urgently be increased. The color clash avoided. Different colors should be assigned to different characters. Paralinguistic elements must be included. And the number of characters needs a limit. Now comes case study number four, Deadpool the video game, released in 2013 by High Moon Studios. The YouTube source for the cutscenes of this beat-em-up is Red's Third Dimension Gaming. This time, you may proceed to analyse the first clip and put yourself in the shoes of a deaf player. What is missing? There we go. That wasn't sinister! That was a clone! Damn, Summers! What'd you have for breakfast? It smells like tacos. You like tacos, Wade? No, you know, I know this hot taco lady, Samantha. Oh, she makes the best... Wade! What if you could never eat one of Samantha's tacos ever again? What you talking about, Thomas? Mr. Sinister is going to kill Samantha, destroy all her tacos, and everyone else on this planet, unless you stop him. Shit just got real. Indeed. So, we going back to back brain style on this one? Uh, no, I can't stay. I'm fighting my own battles in the future, all of which hinge on what you do here and now. Anyway, the real Mr. Sinister is holed up on Magneto's old citadel on the far side of the island. We could argue that Deadpool is no common video game, and fourth wall breaks are even more frequent than the hardcore graphic novel fanatic would ever have imagined. Nevertheless, there are a number of things that, if done, would benefit this product's accessibility. Firstly, we did hear the crickets but a dead person would not have even read them in the subtitle. This decision needs alteration. Also, mood indicators would be highly advisable, as one of the characters, called Wade, or Deadpool, or, to simplify it even more, the masked man, for those of you who are not familiar with the character, together with Cable, the man who is half man, half machine, both interventions range from the hilarious to the raging mad. The music at the beginning of the clip is lost if closed captions are not included, and last but not least, the What You're Talking About Summers features a comical take on a specific North American accent. What to do with accents in traditional or SDH subtitles, both intra- and interlinguistically when we are translating, is proving to be a very fertile line of research, but, as I said, still unresolved. Well, here we are, the moment of truth. Can you believe it? You know, I wasn't sure how you do, but gotta say, you crushed it. Well, we crushed it. We make an amazing team. Nearly brings us to tears. We should do this more often. We thought it'd be better for the game if we did it this way. You know, giving you the glory after we did all. The second clip in the Deadpool video game has been selected as a sample of the inappropriately divided subtitles the lengthy one-liners, and the high speeds the player must endure. As for the sound effects and their description, however, what can be seen on the screen, for instance those energy blasts with which Mr. Sinister attacks the X-Men, together with well-studied controller vibration, would perhaps seem to be sufficient. In our selected collection of screenshots from the video game cutscenes, we can see the idiosyncratic nature of onomatopoeic and paralinguistic elements. In spite of this observation, however, it must be noted that subtitling norms, even more so in their initial stages, when they stand as organized repositories of best practices, are never designed to stifle creativity or limit the versatile nature of the medium. Far from it. Their intention is to gather evidence of what is happening in the industry, and try to facilitate the procedure as far as possible. Norms, for instance, help prevent incongruities such as the one seen here, 
where chevrons and asterisks are used indistinctly for sound descriptions. In addition, they would state clearly and succinctly what a sound description, character identification, noise tagging or paralinguistic element inclusion would comprise exactly. In Deadpool, we have had the chance to see many of the issues the norm should take into consideration, from line division, size, colour, speed and synchrony, to description of noise, sound, mood, character identification, accent inclusion and author typography. Here's our verdict. The subtitle is acceptable with changes. The paralinguistic elements need normalization as well as synchrony. The speed should be reduced. Sometimes it's difficult to follow the subtitle. And, more importantly, we should distinguish between characters, noises, sounds, moods and accents according to coherent criteria. From this point onwards, you will be asked to watch the clips first, produce your own assessment, and then compare it and contrast it with the comments provided and the screenshots which help reinforce the main points of contention. Case study number 5. Alien Isolation, 2014. A survival horror video game developed by Creative Assembly. You may find a complete cutscenes in the links provided thanks to Gamer's Little Playground. There we go. First clip. Consider line length, size, color and speed as the main variables for your subtitle judgment. What did it tell you? We don't know. The unit was taken to Sevastopol Station. It's proprietorial material, so the company wants it to be collected as soon as possible. Sevastopol's a supply depot in the region. It's a, a permanent freeport. I know what it is. Excellent. Now it's time for clip number two. Use the same parameters. Torrance to Ripley. Ripley, we're about to move into position for the auto-umbilical dock sequence. We'll be dark on comms until we've matched the decaying orbit of the station and are in position. We're just waiting on you to extend the towing platform clamps. I don't know how you sweet-talked me into this. And now the assessment. The general quality, as you have seen, is rather poor. The font is unreadable. The text is excessive. And these are clearly not subtitles but simply a fragmentary screenplay, or rather, a literal transcript. Let us have another go with Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2, by Mercury Steam, an action-adventure game released back in 2014. There is a link to the cutscenes in the description. Once again, consider line length, size, colour, speed, orthography, typography and synchrony as your variables. Pay special attention to syntactic coherence in line division. The clip lasts 30 seconds and is followed by seven representative screenshots. You will be given enough time to have a look at them, but you may pause if necessary. Have you brought me another piece? There are still some missing pieces. There is one other piece, and I know who has it. But he isn't here in the castle. Where is he, Sam? Close your eyes. Just for a moment. Very well. Have you got it already? Here's our verdict. We find the subtitles quite acceptable, but there are certain things that need to be changed. For instance, 
we still haven't resolved the question of accent in subtitles. The line divisions are wrong most of the time. There are too many lines, although these are not excessive in length. The amount of on-screen text is, at times, overwhelming, although we should insist that this is a very long video game, so the judgment is rather partial. In conclusion, the subtitles are fine for a traditional subtitle, but we were looking for SVH subtitles, and in fact, that is what we were promised when the video game said that it was accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing. All right then. It is now time for Halo 5, our seventh case study. This is a AAA first-person shooter developed by 343 Industries and released in 2015. Watch the 30-second clip and decide if you notice anything different about the way new subtitle lines are presented to the player. In addition, reflect upon the choice of character identification system, the use of color, and whether any information is lost for the deaf and hard of hearing player. This is Cromwell, Shipboard AI, UNSC Melbourne's Pride. I am yours, Cortana. Colonial Authority AI, Odin. Governor Sloan, the free people of Meridian. I also stand with you, Cortana. Those are the voices of your children calling to Cortana. Shipboard AI, my allegiance is to you. I stand with you, Cortana. Oh dear. We would argue that the disappearance of the upper subtitle lines, while the lower ones remain, the proliferation of text in the lower half of the screen, the use of the same color for all speakers, and the lack of differentiation between the characters who are actually present on the screen from those who are not, such as the hundreds of AI voices, which are referred to in the game by means of the use of italics, as in television or film, increases the level of confusion for the player. The lines are long, the text is tiny, and the colour unclear in certain environments, as we may appreciate in the selected screenshots. The verdict. Acceptable with modifications. It needs further condensation. It needs to reconsider the system of subtitle presentation for the player and the deaf player in particular. Finally, it must include more SDH nuances if it wants to be considered an SDH subtitle, for example mood indicators and sound and noise descriptions. To conclude this preliminary study, let us work in the same condition a deaf player must face, with a premise that this player has English as his or her mother tongue instead of sign language or any other language, which would make the case of audiovisual translation more complicated, as well as add intersemiotic value to the transformations that would be necessary. This first clip is from Catherine, one of the games we discussed earlier. Are the subtitles appropriate? Have we lost anything on the way? Are deaf players in the exact same conditions, as long as the subtitle is present on the screen? Once again, you be the judge. Get ready, and sound off. There we go. Now it's time to compare and contrast. The sound is on. And in other news, we have more on the recent string of unexplained deaths that seem to be exclusively involving young men. Cause of death is unknown, and while police are investigating accidental causes, foul play has apparently not been... Hey, change it! The match is on! Oh, two beers over here! Coming! 
this historic battle in women's Catherine keeps telling me how her mother is constantly calling her. She says she's not worried about it, though. Feather's totally going to take it, right, Vinny? And what do you think? What are the differences, then, between the sound-off and the sound-on versions of the same clip? Firstly, the siren is heard first and seen afterwards, which places the deaf viewer and player at a disadvantage. Also, the breaking news are, inexplicably, not subtitled. They should have been. Ambient noise, eavesdropped conversations in the bar, and the waitress's words are not subtitled when the camera moves further and further into the bar, where the young people are having their weekly encounter. This element should have been present in an SDH subtitle. So, we cannot be sure who is actually speaking at any point. For this reason, we would say that this is not an SDH subtitle. In fact, it is an incomplete traditional subtitle. Finally, one last try in the same conditions. We will use an opening sequence taken from Halo 5. No sound first. There we go. And now, with the additional semiotic layer, can you notice any relevant differences? How many of the differences could perhaps be compensated for making use of non-linguistic resources which are at hand, such as the conjunction of visual elements, which include special effects, with controller vibration following a particular pattern? Have a look. Com check. Com's working fine, last. Copy that, Tanaka. Spartan Buck online and ready. Spartan Veil online. Weapons free. Contact. As you have probably seen, subtitles add very little to the rich sound landscape of the clip, although the idea of considering controller vibration as part of the SDH subtitling norm is remarkably attractive and would invite further development. Our verdict is not SDH, it needs alteration. Given that the particulars of the SDH norm for the video game medium will be discussed more in depth in an upcoming video presentation, let us take stock of what we have observed so far. Which categories should the SDH norm focus more specifically on? As for the degree of faithfulness, is it a subtitle or is it a transcript? They are not the same. Subtitle type, is it traditional or is it SDH? Does it contain more information than the usual ones? As for its normativity, is it idiosyncratic? Does it decide what to do depending on a whim? Or does it use conventions? As for the relationship between the sound and the text, we should pay special attention to dialogue, music and soundtrack, tagging or speaker identification, text on screen or in-game instructions, paralinguistic elements, onomatopoeia and its use, and didascalic mood indicators, the attitude of the speakers towards what they are saying. Lastly, the purely textual level. What does it comprise and what should appear in a future norm? Obviously the sequencing, because from the transcript to the subtitle, there is a distinction, and that is precisely how the information is channeled in a more condensed way. The maximum number of lines is something to be decided, but two is the ideal. Line division, it has to be syntactically coherent, we said. The shot changes, let's not forget those. 
the speed measured in CPS or characters per second, orthography and typography, as relevant as in any textual representation, capitalization, emphasis and the use of italics, which is controversial even in television and other formats, such as film, for instance. Here are the last questions for you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. Question number one. Where do the inconsistencies lie when we discuss accessibility in video games and the presence of SDH subtitles in this medium? And question number two. Would a common framework of reference really be deleterious for the creative freedom or the originality of this industry? And with this, feel free to leave any comments. Thank you all for taking an interest in this presentation. It has really been a pleasure for me. Bye!